Twitter, there we go. Unconscious competence. I've kind of bookmarked certain parts I want to speak about, but I'm going to have to freestyle it because I know it's going to be a madness otherwise. So, just to give you an understanding, or actually give you some examples of what you may have experienced in terms of unconscious competence. So the first one I would say is when you, you were a toddler, even though you may not remember, or you're a child or a toddler, when they stand up, or you may have a sibling, um, you notice that they're focusing for the first time and the first few times is extreme focus. Their head is in that space. Everything goes into standing up until they get celebrations and see parents high-fiving, look, he or she's standing up. And then their focus moves from here, all the energy and focus here, to what the noise was and then they drop. Now, after a period of time, they develop the ability to stand up unconsciously. So they pass that information back to the unconscious mind. And that's some, it's, it still requires the same effort, even now for me and yourself, but we just don't need to consciously think about it. And it's the same, you know, the same process that happens where we pump blood around our bodies, etc. And then if you fast forward to driving, where if you're someone who did driving lessons and now passed your test, what you would notice is when you get into a car, your head is in the car, it's in that space. So it's like steering wheel, you know, brake, handbrake, etc. You're driving slow because your head's in the car and you're focusing. The more you drive, the more you can push it back to your unconscious mind. Now your head's at the bonnet, now your head's up the road. You pass your test, you can look and think, oh, actually, there's loads of traffic up there. I'm going to take this turn in and, you know, bypass the traffic. Now bring it into football. Again, young players playing, you know, doing the basic drills, repetition, repetition, repetition. The more comfortable they get receiving the ball, passing the ball, then they can construct images in their mind. And we tell them to do it, but it's not just a case of choice. So now they're more comfortable in doing it because of the repetition. So their head, again, is in that space. The ball's coming and to focus on the ball, touching my foot, then passing it. The more I do it, now my, my head can be up. So I remember when I was younger, they would say, oh, get your head up. No, but I need to feel comfortable doing that. So it's like the child standing up, you know, my head's in this space or getting in the car. It's the same thing. I need to keep repeating the ball to, to my foot. Okay, now I can get my head up. Now I can construct images because I can see everything. So the unconscious competence is about managing information whilst doing the job, you know, because we can only manage a certain amount of information consciously. All right, so... Using the example from an experienced player, this wasn't a quote given to me by this player, but this was actually in his book, and it's by Zlatan Ibrahimovic. It was like a dance, and even though I wasn't conscious of it, I dribbled past every one of the defenders and told, towed the ball into the net with my left foot. An example, so, and now those are his words, I wasn't conscious of it. So, let's go to the next bit that I've bookmarked, but I can't remember why I bookmarked it. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, this is an interesting one, um, and it's a player that played at Charlton with myself. And I'm going to read it to you first before I explain it. I played for England at youth level alongside my strike partner, Michael Owen, and went on to score goals in the Premier League. I'm one of only five people to score a hat-trick against Liverpool, but I didn't feel I really belonged until I was 29. Before that, I would play in the first team and do what I felt was required of me, but I wasn't scoring like I did in the reserves. Because I was a first team player coming down to the reserves, it felt as though I was helping them out. So I was able to just play like I was on autopilot. Sorry, uh, I'm a bit cheesy. Ironically, a time I was able to do this in the first team was the week I got booed by my own fans. Why? Because I didn't give a I stopped caring, I stopped thinking and just played. Everything I did came off and that was also the week I scored the hat-trick against Liverpool. First of all, so by the way, sorry, that was Kevin Lisby. Now, first of all, I experienced um, a similar, similar situation in terms of how I was overwhelmed by anxiety. I felt like I was being um, micromanaged by my manager and it affected how I felt and it affected how I played. So listening to that, it could actually go into state. Now, and I, when you read this book, many chapters cross over. But as I highlighted, you know, when um, Kevin spoke about not caring and he was able to go into autopilot, he didn't interrupt the process. So even though we can develop skills 
where we're at a certain level of capability, where you know we're really good, we're flying, that process can be interrupted. And that's why I started off with state and said that state is probably the most important of the bunch because regardless of whatever you do and how many times you practice, how you feel will interrupt that process. So Kevin's example was a perfect, exa um, yeah, a perfect example of that. Okay, let me look at another bit that I highlighted. So, ah, so now we look at stages of unconscious competence. Unconscious competence is a big deal. Look at what a player has to do from the second before they receive the ball to the second after they have possession. A total of three seconds. In that time, they need to visualize the different options open to them once they get the ball so that they can select and apply the action in milliseconds. So before they get the ball, they're collecting data. You know, that, that defender looks like they're gonna close my player down or they might get sucked in up and play in behind. You know, this one's next to me as like my safety option. You know what, there's a little gap there I might exploit and run into. Decide how to receive the ball. So they have to, you know, assess their options in their mind. Decide what to do with their with their first touch. And this is important because, especially on social media, you, you see players booting the ball up in the air and saying it's a great touch. I don't think, I mean, you can, it, no, actually, let me be, not be extra. You can say it's a great touch. But I just find it interesting that we don't talk about touch variations and when they're needed. So I see some brilliant touches that are, I would class as brilliant because of the decision made, not necessarily the physical, um, the technical aspect of it. It could be a case of it's a real tight situation and they literally touch it so much that they get out of that situation, but so it doesn't go to another compromising situation. It was the perfect way. So deciding um, what to do with their first touch is important. Being aware of space. So playing in between the lines. Being aware of their teammates, which I kind of touched on before in terms of when they construct their images. Being aware of their opponents, which I touched on. Assess the capability of their opponents. Now, when you look at some of the top teams, naturally, or I, well, let me not go to the top teams. In our teams, we, we create a hierarchy. And so what will happen is, is there's that, that saviour, that person that when we're in trouble, we're going to look to give it to more. We have to be honest, there are some teams or some players in your team that you don't rate as much. So you're not going to give them the ball unless you have to. It's, it's something that people just do. They get frustrated. So what 